Ladies and gentlemen, please notice that exits are conveniently located at the front and rear of this auditorium. When leaving the theater, we suggest that the exit at the front of the auditorium will allow you easier access to the parking areas. Thank you. Oh, stop your slow clap. <laughs> why, are you, why are you from Texas now? Because uh, I got to choose my stock. <laughs> How's that for high energy? That's false advertising. <laughs> no. Oh, come on. <laughs> Does every actor that portrays a cop in a movie have to wear a fedora? You heard it here, folks. <laughs> Mike Field <laughs> is dead inside. I'm actually trying to figure out who Brooklyn Duck is married to. Nice. What? She doesn't like, say it like she that. She does say it like that. She doesn't say it's it like stupid. that. stupid. Cowards. Cowards is what they're called, Mike. They're called cowards. Hello, I'm Mike Butler. And I'm Mike Field. And you are listening to the Forgotten Cinema Podcast. Each episode, we highlight a film that, for a variety of reasons, was forgotten by audiences. Whether it be because a more popular movie was released at the same time, or the film simply didn't catch on with an audience in its initial run. We'll discuss what we love about the film, or perhaps don't love about it, but we'll always recommend you revisit. If you enjoy our podcast, please feel free to rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to this podcast. The game is afoot, Watson. <gasps> Teenage Sherlock Holmes meets and befriends his future sidekick, the bemused and bespeckled John Watson. During their first semester of boarding school, a series of deaths occur on campus. Intrigued by the crime, Holmes looks into it and soon comes to suspect a poisonous hallucinogen. <laughs> and then in the midst of their investigation, Holmes and Watson stumble on a bizarre cult with a penchant for human sacrifice, after which they must struggle to escape. I am talking about young Sherlock Holmes. Cue the music. What music? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we are going back to the 80s, to my time. <laughs> uh, young Sherlock Holmes is a runtime of 109 minutes, PG-13. Production budget of what? What are you looking at me like that for? Nothing. Oh, I'm just paying attention. Okay. A little <laughs> weird. Production budget of $18 million. <laughs> Uh, opening weekend, it did 2.5 million. Domestic, it did 19 and worldwide 19. So clearly not a lot. I mean, clearly not a hit, unfortunately, even though I, as a special place in my heart for this movie, just did not, I guess, capture anyone else's in the entire world. Oh. <laughs> it was released on December 6, 1985, distributed by Paramount Pictures, production company Emblem Entertainment. And if you know who that is, that is Steven Spielberg. There you go. So on the six, it went up against Spies Like Us, the Dan Aykroyd, Chevy Chase uh, comedy, which is eh, not bad. I like Spies Like Us. I like it too, but like I feel like if I watched it again, I might not like it as much. There's stuff I really like in it, but I just feel like I don't know if I like it that much. You wouldn't appreciate the eightiesness of it. I might. No, no, no. <laughs> I might. It also went up against White Knights. Uh, the week after the thirteenth, you had Jewel of the Nile and. A movie we did already for last week, season last year, season five. Oh. Clue. Clue. Man. <laughs> well, also, you had an unlimited run on, on the 18th. You had the movie Brazil, which is a movie that we just did. That's right. All right. That's and that, episode three of the season, I believe. It is. Do, do, do. A week prior to this, which was Thanksgiving week, the 27th of November, you had Rocky Four. Everyone loves that. And then Santa Claus, the movie. Now, I'm going to really I'm going to talk about Rocky Four a little bit here. Did you see that he is re-editing Rocky IV? That's right. Did you notice that he is removing the robot? I did, and I was really upset about that. A exactly. I'm sorry, but Happy Birthday, Polly is a staple in terms of a <laughs> quote, and to eliminate that quote is just uh, uh, upsetting. Happy uh, Birthday, Polly. Exactly. Exactly. Well done. Well said, Mr. Butler. Well said. This movie, Young Sherlock Holmes, is directed by Barry Levinson. He has won the Oscar for directing Rain Man. He also did The Natural, Sphere, which is an episode you'll never hear. Sleepers and the TV <laughs> movie Paterno starring Al Pacino, which is about Joe Paterno, which is very good if you haven't caught it. It's on HBO. Written by Chris Columbus. He has done Gremlins, The Goonies, Nine Months, Only the Lonely. He was nominated for an Oscar for The Help, where he was a producer, and he was the director of the first two Harry Potters. You mean the sequels to Young Sherlock Holmes? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, prequel. No sequels. Cinematography by Stephen Goldblatt. He was uh, nominated for an Oscar for The Prince of Tides, Batman Forever. He also has done The Intern and The Cotton Club and the TV miniseries Angels in America, which is very good, also on HBO, and the movie Lethal Weapon. I don't know if you ever heard of that before. Composer by Bruce Bruce Broughton or Broughton? Broughton. 
Broughton. Let's say Broughton. I think Broughton's right. Nominated for an Oscar for Silverado. He was also did So I Made an Axe Murder, another episode we did, Butler. That's right. Tombstone as well. We didn't do an episode of Tombstone, but he is did the music for Tombstone. Tombstone's very good. It, it is. Well, yeah. I prefer Wyatt Earp. I like Tombstone, but I'm a Wyatt Earp guy. I've actually never seen Wyatt Earp. Uh, you might like that. I think I would. Then I just haven't got around to watch it. Um, everyone always compares the uh, Doc Holliday's in that one. Mm-hmm. So uh, while Val Kilmer's Doc Holliday is very good, it's more of like a commercial Doc Holliday. Yeah. Of like, like it's like, but Dennis Quaid's Doc Holliday is really good. I'm just going to throw that out there. But anyways, produced <laughs> by Mark Johnson, as many of, the, of many other producers. He won an Oscar for producing Rain Man. He also produced El Camino, the Breaking Bad movie. He also did Breaking Bad, the TV show, and Better Call Saul, the TV show. And A Perfect World, Bugsy and Donnie Brasco. So he's been around. This is the first movie that was produced by the Fonz. Henry hey! Winkler. He, <laughs> he's gone on to other, then produce The Sure Thing and the TV show MacGyver. He's also in the TV show Barry, which... Mike and I are fans of. And he just won the uh, Emmy for that last year. Congratulations, uh, Mr. Winkler. Or no, maybe that was two years ago. And then, whatever, I don't care. And then <laughs> produced by Steven Spielberg, which you already mentioned. And if you don't know who he is, turn off this podcast, go look him up, watch his movies, then come back to this podcast, and then we'll talk about it. But you really should know who he is. If you don't know Steven Spielberg, you don't deserve to watch Ooh, Well, we don't watch Forgotten Cinema. You listen to it. I always say watch. I know, you suck. <laughs> Edited by Stu Linder. He's won the Oscar for editing for Grand Prix. He also was nominated for Rain Man, and he's done Quiz Show, which is a really good movie you should watch, and Tin Men, which is another good movie. So this movie's this movie itself, Young Sherlock Holmes, has probably actors you have never heard before, or maybe have heard before, but they're not in a lot of stuff. Yeah. So you had Nicholas Rowe playing Sherlock Holmes. He did Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. He's also an Enigma and Waiting for Anya. Alan Cox is John Watson, who's been in an awfully big adventure. Mrs. Dalloway and the Dictator. Sophie Ward is Elizabeth Hardy. She's in Book of Blood, Little Dorrit, Wuthering Heights, and then the 2011 Jane Eyre. Anthony Higgins as Professor Wraith, who then becomes Professor Moriarty. Well, spoilers. Spoiler alert. <laughs> he is in Raiders of the Lost Ark, The Bride, and The Draftsman Contract. The Draftsman? Draftsman. Draftsman. Because it, it's in English, so yep. it's screwing me up. Uh, Susan Fleetwood as Mrs. Dribb. She was in the 1981 Clash of the Titans. She's also in The Sacrifice, The Craze, and Persuasion. Freddie Jones as Chester Cragwich. What, how about that for a name? Chester. He's in the 1984 Dune, Firestarter, The Elephant Man, and the 2002 Count of Monte Cristo, which is a very good movie. Yes. Nigel Stock as Rupert Waxflatter. He is in The Great Escape, The Lion in Winter, and Cromwell. It's like they took a look at the names in this movie, and they were like, they're not British enough. Cragwich. <laughs> Roger Ashton Griffiths as Dr. Sed- Sergeant Lestrade, Detective Sergeant Lestrade, Doctor. He's in uh, Game of Thrones. He plays Mace Tyrell on the Game of Thrones TV show. He was in Braxel and he, Braxel? I think he was in Bra- Brazil. Or maybe he was in Braxel. Maybe that's a typo. Who cares? And he's also in Christopher Robin. <laughs> and then Earl Rhodes as Dudley. And my other credit for him is not much. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, sorry, Mr. Rhodes. All right, Butler. Now, I like this movie. This is a this is a movie that I watched when I was younger. I will say that it was nominated for two Academy Awards: Best Effects and Visual Effects. Uh, this was in 1986. I guess that was two different awards. Oh no, I take it back. I'm sorry. It was one award. It's just called Best Effects, Visual Effects. Okay. And primarily for, I mean, which scene? Because I know you love the scene the most. So it's the stained glass man scene. Correct. Correct. Which is the only thing I knew about this movie. I, I even forgot that that's what the movie it was in. Yeah. But I knew that the first computer, basically the first computer effect, was correct. The Stained Glass Man, which was done by Pixar. Well, it was done by ILM, but ILM. it was overseen by John Lasseter, yeah. who was part of Pixar. Kind of the part beginning, of yeah. yeah. No, I got you. It was part of ILM at the time. Pixar is in the credit, uh, but it's it, that's kind of like the beginning. It, it took four months to create that that uh, that effect. I don't know if you want to kind of describe the scene real quick. So the enemy in the film uses a hallucinogen. Yeah. And they hit a priest with this hallucinogen. He goes into his church, sees a big knight on the stained glass door or window. The stained glass knight on the window pops out, grabs his sword, and starts approaching the priest. Mm-hmm. And so the stained glass is now a creature that's moving toward him. And it's done really well. I think it still holds up. Yeah. I think probably because the sim- simplicity of a character that's stained glass mm-hmm. has a lot of edges and corners, which back then computer animation curves, obviously. I don't think that's right, difficult. right, right. Um, but yeah, I I was watching that and go like kind of like I do with Jurassic Park in most scenes where it's like when CG is done right or in the right, shown in the right way, 
Mm -hmm. Like it, it really does still hold up sometimes. And this yeah. is one of the scenes where I was like, that's, that's pretty damn impressive. Well, you also, I mean, I like this scene. I don't think you like the scene as much as when the, uh, this Cornish hen starts attacking him. Oh, I love the scene. Yeah. I just think it's funny. <laughs> it's funny, but it, it's, it's practical. It, it, it grounds the movie, but it's, uh, it, I thought it was done well for 1985. I thought sure, it was puppetry, well. It's kind of creepy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that does better than the pastries that are come to life. So uh, just shoving themselves uh, in Watson's mouth. We'll talk about that. <laughs> well, I'm talking about it right now. <laughs> I, first of all, the pastries die every time they go into Watson's mouth. They're That's killing they themselves. They want to die. They want they to want be to eaten. They, they, that, that, is their, that is their manifest destiny. I'd, be, I'd just be eating them. I'd be like, all right, you want to go? Let's go. I don't know how that's horrifying. <laughs> it's like, come on, cannoli. What you got? Well, then maybe you're then probably you're more in tune of the sausages and sausage party then, right? Ugh, I hate that. Ugh. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> all right. So this movie is supposed to, it's presupposing. It's a prequel. It's not real. Um, it's just pretending uh, that or not pretending. That's a bad word. It's kind of an homage to like maybe Holmes and Watson met uh, in boarding school when they were younger. And I kind of you you kind of get the little references to what happens on later on in the Sherlock Holmes. Right. This is a famous, famous, famous uh, character in fiction that was created by Arthur Conan Doyle. Uh, and it's, he's just basically it's supposed to be based on a real life person that uh, Doyle knew who was just just almost like Holmes, like very intelligent, very observant. Um, and so it was just kind of, cause there's another book. I, there's a book out there by Mark Frost called the list of seven. And then he wrote a sequel called the six messiahs. And that is, I don't know if we talked about this, but that is supposed to be, that's Arthur Conan Doyle is in those books and he is with somebody who is the, who becomes is, who is the guy who we uh, become inspiration, inspiration, inspiration for Sherlock Holmes. And they are solving mysteries. They're actually pretty good books. Mark Frost cool. wrote. A lot of Twin Peaks episodes. Yes, he did. I also so, believe he wrote some X Files. I did. So yeah. So you you probably should catch that. I actually That's own that. So if yeah. you ever want to borrow, if you ever feel like feel like reading, let me know. <laughs> so there are like stuff in like the Deer Stalker hat at the end, the pipe. They have the pipe throughout the move the movie. Right. Um. He assembles his outfit. Although they do have the text that they're in the movie that's like basically like, hey. This isn't official. Right. I, I think they had to put that in there out of respect for uh, the works of Conan Doyle, the, like the state for Conan Doyle, because they you could Sherlock Holmes is in the um, public domain and you can do a Sherlock Holmes movie. There's certain things you can't do uh, in terms of some, maybe certain stories or certain. Um, there are things that aren't old enough yet, but there's certain like traits you can't do because I know the Enola Holmes show on Netflix or the movie on Netflix run ran into that issue. Well, Holmes I Holmes can't show emotion. Right, right. And that that, that was the which, emotional Holmes is only toward the end of his novels. And so that is still not in the public domain. Which I can't believe that that's not that's weird. That's really just weird. So, so. it really is not like, okay, I've created this character in this year. Yeah. It's like, all right, but this character spans into that. So you gotta wait till that timeline catches up. Yeah, yeah. Before you can use those. It's aspects. odd. It's uh, I don't get that. But whatever, that's you know, that's part of the that's part of what it is. I mean, I'm gonna watch Enola Holmes because I I know it's not. I'm not the audience. I know it's a young YA audience, right? That, that's more of a uh, yeah, YA, yeah, yeah. But but I'm gonna watch it because I like Sherlock Holmes. It looks all right, and I don't care if the kids don't want to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> now I will pretty much read. It's tough because everybody will do a Sherlock Holmes book, but I will read books by authors that I like, like Anthony Horowitz did the two, did the House of Silk, right? And he did um, I did Moriarty, and I read those, and those are really good. And then I've read Caleb Carr has did a, the Italian secretary, which is like a not kind of like a novella, but it was a Sherlock Holmes story. So I'll the authors that I like, I'll read their Sherlock Holmes books. But there's so many people that write Sherlock Holmes books. It's ridiculous. Yeah, you can't catch up with all. Right. Of them. I even I even tried to read um, oh, it was I can't remember the name of it, but it was basically about she is she was known as the Amer uh, female Sherlock Holmes. She was in New York. I can't remember the name of the book. I can't remember the name who wrote it. I tried to read that. I, I couldn't get into it. It was too, I don't know. I just, maybe is I wasn't that not right. what the alienist is? No, the okay. alienist is the alienist is a written by Caleb Carr and, and angel of darkness, which is the sequel. I know they're on TNT, but read the books. They're really good. The books are better. They're um, more about the first serial killer within the, in America, like the first right. time they were tracking a serial killer. They never knew anything about serial killers and they still didn't until uh, the 40, uh, no, excuse me, until like the fifties or sixties, when they were calling them thrill killers, right, which is what the show Manhunter is about, which is about the beginning of the behavioral science unit uh, in the FBI, which then they start referring to them as serial killers because they they didn't really have any concept of that. People just right. killing multiple people, 
No. So anyway, so I know we got off topic, but <laughs> all that stuff that I have referenced is good. You should definitely read and watch all that stuff. I, Basically, I you're a big time mystery. I do like mysteries. You're stemming from Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. That's that's your that's your. Band. I like crime. I like I like like I like that mystery kind of nonfiction or even fictional, uh, you know, historical fiction stuff like that. Right. I um I do like I like historical fiction to a point. Like while I read Abraham Lincoln, uh, Vampire Hunter, right? Is that what it's called? That's yeah, what it's called. Uh, it's the, and I've seen the movie. I'm like, okay, that's fun. I go, but that's not really what I dig on. I dig on stuff that like could happen. Right. Like would be funny. Like, I guess I'm going to, I'm going to tangent here. I have a script out. I wrote a script called super chief. And that is about just super chief railroad that goes from Chicago to LA. And on that railroad, they used to carry, they used to have a courier on there who was a Lieutenant in the army and used to dress as a regular salesman, but he would have a, a, a briefcase attached to his arm that will attach to his arm in terms of like handcuffed to his arm that would that would hold these flakes of uh plutonium or these you i can't remember that because the i can't remember the exact title you two five six flakes i believe that were from uh excuse me that were put together that were kind of created in an army base in tennessee they were driven up to chicago he he'd go to la but he'd get he'd get off before la to go take him to uh where they were making the atomic bomb yeah so on that same, so he would do this, they would do this constantly. And on that same train, I have when Frank Sinatra moves from New York to LA to move his family to kind of save his quote unquote marriage. Well, I don't know I'm quoting the marriage, but save his marriage. He boards that train to go on there, to go to LA, to kind of let his move. So right. I have a, in this story in the springtime of 43, he is on that train and there is that couriers on that train. And then there's a Nazi plot to steal those flakes. And then Sinatra, in my story, Sinatra is involved in that in, in terms of becoming a hero because you have to remember at that time when Sinatra's moving, he is being called a coward in the press because he, he tried to, he wanted to enlist and he kept getting denied, kept, kept getting 4F because he had an uh, in injury to his ear. And they wouldn't let him go. Right. And so he hated that. But people in the press were, were slamming him about him. He was a coward. He's not American, not patriotic. So when he boards this train, it's like that kind of like is fueling him. And he, he's the hero of the story. Right. It's called Super Chief. If anyone's interested. TM, 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 TM. Don't steal it. <laughs> Don't, it. It's too late. I've already. It's already. You've already got uh, it. I've already there. got it. No, no, no. I've already. Yeah, it's already registered. With That's this. right. You sons of bitches. <laughs> <laughs> Are you trying to angle to play Sinatra? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Is it working? <laughs> uh, I'm all. Listen. I'm not gonna. I can't do that movie. It's all. It's because it takes place aboard a train. I wrote that movie. Someone else go do it. <laughs> just, just pay me for the script. But anyways, I know. And now we're way off topic. So young Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I. Some stuff holds up for me. We always, we always revisit these movies. It's always like, oh, I like that. I like that. It's, it's definitely very Spielberg. Oh yeah, yeah. So I mean, kind of. I mean, just kind of start. I've talked too much. So go, go and go and say something. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I, I think I would have really enjoyed this movie had I watched it when I was younger. I think this would have been something I would throw in the VCR constantly. Yeah, uh, for sure. I would very much like this movie. Having watched it now, it's okay. It's got some stuff I like, and it's got a decent amount of stuff that I'm not huge fan of. Such and the other thing, as... well, so the, go ahead, go the ahead, one go thing ahead. that really. I'm not going to say ruin it. Cause like I said, I like it. I just think I would have liked it better younger, which yeah, it's what it's for. It's for a younger audience is the, I just, it's so Harry Potter. It is just so oh, yeah. Harry Potter. It's, yeah. just, it's hard now to watch it without those comparisons in my head to the first Harry Potter to a lot of the first Harry Potter. Yeah. That kind of like bright schoolyard stuff. Chris Columbus put a lot of that into Sorcerer's Stone. Just, I don't think on purpose. I just think that that's his mentality. Sure, yeah. yeah it's yeah. very Chris Columbus and that that bleeds into Harry Potter, but that's also how we are introduced to that world. Right. So that's how I'm introduced to this world. And I'm making that comparison because even though this came first, I saw yeah. Harry Potter first. Do you do you think that the the movie was an influence on Rowling when she wrote? I mean, I I don't know. I mean, like in the kind of like on subconsciously. I it mean, could be, or this could just be like British school. Yeah, no, I got then. you. So I, I'm just not sure, or that's just how British boarding schools are, or I'm I, like I don't know. Yeah, I got you. But no, yeah, it's all very you. like the the their boarding school is very much Hogwartsy. Yeah, you got the crazy uncle up in the bell tower making crazy inventions. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. classes are like the the chemistry class has potion bottles all over the yeah, place. Yeah, I got you. Attention in class. Well, I mean, maybe that's they're using the same reference points. Watson's your Weasley. 
Well, hold on now. <laughs> hold on. Uh, Watson's in this movie. Watson's a little like I know they give him stuff like he saw. He, he comes up with stuff, but he's very bumbly. He's very he's very Denholm Elliott. He's very uh, Marcus Brody in Raiders, like in yeah. the third one. He's very stumbly, bumbly. If that's you know what I mean? He's just like the stuff they give him to solve is lip service almost. I think that's that's kind of how Watson was always portrayed in, in films and TV before this as well. So I think that's what they carry on to. Right. Even though in the novels, he's a war doctor. He's intelligent in his own. Well, he, I like his portrayal in the new Sherlock Holmes with Jude Law. I actually like him in Sherlock, Martin, Martin, Freeman, Martin Freeman's yeah. character. I mean, yeah, I, I, I do prefer a Watson that's more formidable to Holmes um, than just a foil. I don't like that. That, that. That's not interesting to me anymore in terms, you know what I mean? It's just a sounding board. At the, that yeah, point. I don't yeah. like that. Like, like it could be anybody. Like, there needs to be, because he's with Holmes so much for so long, wherever you come into the story of any kind of Sherlock Holmes movie or, or television show or whatever, right. that there, I know that Holmes can't have emotion. I'm sorry, you're not with a person that long without having some kind of emotional connection to him that you, you feel the need. He always needs to be there. He can't be somebody more that you can just make fun of and just kind of like bounce ideas off of. He's got to be a more of a meaningful connection. Right. I mean, he lives with Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. Friends, right. It's like they're, they're friends for a reason, not just to make Sherlock Holmes feel good about himself. Right. And he like yeah. feels smarter, like the smartest guy in the room. Yeah. And the Jew Law character in the movie is more he can handle himself and he can take care of right. business without Holmes. Like if Holmes wasn't around, he would still be kicking ass. Probably. And he can also stick it to Holmes. And absolutely. He's really not in. He's around Holmes. As well. He's not in awe of Holmes. He's more of like it's almost an annoyance when Holmes does his stuff, right. which I like. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, I get that this is Watson's first time meeting him. So. Sure. He is in awe of how smart he is. Uh, but quite you, you'd yet. like to think that he would hold his own. Like in the beginning, Holmes is very, in this movie, uh, he's very, I feel like nose in the air kind of thing a little. A little. He is absolutely, yeah, he, he knows he's smart. He's almost like, even though he's proto-Holmes and that he kind of still has emotion and that's what he has to work out of his character kind yeah. of, he is still basically your Holmes. He's already Holmes. He's already super smart. He can already yeah. solve and deduce. But I don't buy the friendship that he all of a sudden gets with Watson, mm -hmm. other than maybe Watson doesn't hate him like the rest of his class. Yeah. But I also didn't get that anybody really hates uh, Sherlock except for that one Draco Malfoy ripoff, who again oh, exactly. is not a ripoff. Exactly. Because he's first. Yeah, yeah no, I got you. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I can agree with that. Uh, I This movie's intent is not what we're talking about. It's intent. It's just, it's an adventure. It's for it's a young adult before there was YA. Right. Let's young get adult these guys adventure. together. Yeah. Here's how Watson's That's fine. portrayed in the movie. So but, that's how people know. Right. But knowing Holmes the way we have seen Holmes and read Holmes, you would think that his childhood would be more um, fish out of water. He doesn't know how to interact with other people. So right. he would be, you know what I mean? Like if he, d he doesn't have emotion or, but I know like in this movie, they're saying like, He's emotional in this movie and it, it's the ending of this movie where it kind of starts sucking. He starts becoming devoid of emotion because he can't have emotion because even Wraith says that to him. And the, he loses that first sword fight. Your downfall is your emotion. So like it's almost like they're showing he was never like the way he is now. Now, gentlemen, Mr. Holmes lost because of one important factor. His emotions took over. He ignored discipline. Never replace discipline with emotion. Well played, Holmes. Which is cool, but probably more believable is the fact that he never probably had emotion. He was just kind of well, like... Well, the novels, it was always, you always figured it was his home life. Right. It was the, the way it is, the way his brother... Because his brother, they do... His brother in the show, Sherlock, they do it more where he's more of a character, but he's more of the same style as Holmes. He's just as smart as Holmes and... Yeah, maybe and even, even more smarter. Though. Yeah, but he's and he's a little bit more devious, and they don't get along a little bit. So there's so you get like their home life was not great, and they actually do show that in they this show movie. that a little bit. Yeah, and the nightmare that Holmes has. Yeah, with his father. His father yells at him for he says he, like, you should. You almost get the feeling like Holmes found out that his father was cheating on his yes. wife. Yeah, he told you told he told his mom. Yeah. yeah, I think that he he told his mother that he saw his father with another woman. Yeah. And then that, that kind of like soured that whole relationship between his father. And then I think, you know, that kind of, you know, but but again, if that happened in his childhood, you wouldn't think that he'd be the way he is now as a young adult, as an as a teenager. He would be a little bit more. I don't want to talk to people. I don't want to be involved. And right. Yeah. But he falls in love. He's in love with um, the, the the daughter of uh, he's in love with Elizabeth. So, the, yeah. The daughter of like his favorite teacher who was who is now in the in the attic retired and sent to the attic where he's making flying machines. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, did you know that the original title for this, or it was retitled, excuse me, not the original title, but it was retitled uh, in the U- United Kingdom and Australia as Young Sherlock Holmes and the Pyramid of Fear? I dumb, dumb, dumb. I get why they did that, though. Why is that? Because it's an adventure film. Your Indiana Jones films have done really well, yep. and their character and the blank. Well, you're, you're, so you add yeah, that in there. Your Indiana Jones, two of them have already come out because Temple of Doom was 84. So yeah, yeah, so absolutely. So now you're like, oh, well, that, that works. Let's go with that. Plus, that's kind of how the old adventure serials used to be called as well. I agree. Yep. But yeah, I, the pyramid is like, it's in there, but it's like, it really shades the movie in a different light than it really is. Well, why don't we talk about the plot of the bad guys? Why don't you go a little bit into, I mean, I kind of did it in my synopsis, right. but that synopsis was not great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, what, what's, what's happening here? So essentially... Our good doctor, or our good, I guess he's not really a professor. Professor he Rafe. It. He's still a like, professor, even though it's a kid's school? It is. He is They call professor, him professor, yeah. yeah. So the good professor Rafe is actually half Egyptian. Ooh. And the people that have been dying on the streets of uh, London uh, through looks like suicide, even though they've been hallucinating. All the like, stuff that we just talked about, yeah. yeah, the Cornish hen. And, it's and all the, done yes. by this Egyptian cult. Because those men found a tomb in Egypt. Uh, from this cult that they are part and the ancient tombs and the princesses that they had sacrificed they sacrificed five princesses and they did this while building a hotel so they basically uh what's it called something on consecrated ground they They desecrated yeah desecrated (laughs) consecrated ground you they remove the headstones but never remove the graves (laughs) they remove the headstones but never remove the graves sorry (laughs) so basically the cult put up a stink the british army was involved (laughs) hey man that's not cool (laughs) yeah the British army, because at that point, uh, Egypt was part of the British Empire. Yes. Uh, gunned down some of these cult members, including Wraith's parents and yes. his sister's parents. And his sister is the cultist going around shooting people with these hallucinogens. You, well, you find you that later. The, his sister is Mrs. Dribb, who is the school nurse. School nurse. Yes. Yep. But she is she wears a wig because she's completely bald, right? All all of the cult members except for Rafe. Yeah, all. which is yeah, which yeah. is interesting. No, no, guys, I'm in control. No, the listen, leader keeps the hair. I don't know if you read the tablets, but uh, it says here that I keep my hair. But Look at that head of hair. That you looks nerds like a headdress. need no. to shave. <laughs> shave your head, nerds. <laughs> uh, so these Wraiths and his cult that is now in London are yeah. going to sacrifice these new these women. Take revenge on the people that were involved in the original plot. Yeah. Kill these new five women to be the new five priestesses in a tomb he's rebuilt somewhere hidden in London. They bury they basically bury them alive. They're given they're given some kind of toxin that freezes them up, but they can feel everything. And it's they're... very Temple of Doom. Oh no. <laughs> That's one of my notes is when they're watching when Holmes and Elizabeth and Watson are watching the ceremony of one of the of the of the one of the women that they capture, they're peering through a headstone a uh, like serpent the, head I yeah believe. but yeah. They're, they're in the eyes and it's just like they put it's absolutely like temple of doom um i was so, waiting for someone to go kalima kalima <laughs> 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 um no there's there there is so many like you talk about harry potter we just talked about temple of doom this movie i almost feel like this movie could use a remake I, on IMDb, there's a young Sherlock Holmes listed as in production, but no facts about no, it. No, yeah, but I if they were to do that, I would. I don't want anybody in there. I don't know. I want. I want people that you don't know. I want, but it should be like just in the same vein as this. Don't make it dark, but make it like an adventure. Make it, uh, just make it better. Just do. Although I do like. There's. I know. I, I like this movie, and I, sure. it does have. There are moments when you watch this movie and you're just kind of like, all right, that's that's eighties. I get it, but for the eighties, the sets, the just the look of the movie, the way the movie's set up, the look of the movie, the ending when they're on the big ice blocks and they're fighting. Like, oh yeah, I, the, I liked all that. I thought that was still well done. I thought it was. I know it's a set. I know that they're on a soundstage, but I don't care. I like. I enjoy that. Um, so I yes, I'm looking at it with re- uh, rose colored glasses. Um, you know, it's a movie that I watched when I was younger. So absolutely that kind of nostalgic feel is there for me and influences my appreciation of this movie. Sure. But, I, but your points are, are accurate. They're well, you know, I can't, I can't discount them in terms of just like some little issues with it. Uh, so I, I'm okay with that. I just, I kind of excuse it, I guess. Um, you know, like the whole Watson stuff, like he's like a, he's like a third wheel constantly in this yeah. movie. Well, like I said, if, 
if I had watched this younger, if my parents had shown me this when I was a kid, yeah, it would be on rewind along with Indiana Jones. I would yeah. keep watching it because when I was younger, I also loved the young Indiana Jones Chronicles. I loved all those adventures mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. It's just watching it now, having been peppered with things that are so so like this, yeah, and not having watched it with those rose colored glasses, where as a child you forgive a lot of this stuff. Yeah. And also, like we also said, Watson, I mean, I didn't read my first Sherlock Holmes novel until probably freshman year of high school. Mm-hmm. It was probably the first time I picked it up. And then Watson now hasn't been shown in the right way until just recently. Yeah. So watching it back then, I would have forgiven that because that's how I would have always seen Sherlock Holmes and Watson. Right. And as a kid, the the cheesy stuff just works for you. Like that's like, that's why it's there. Well, the, the yeah. food attacking Watson is there for kids to be like, oh, that's funny, but also kind of scary. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, but that's as good, adults, though. we're watching like eh. we talk about that, though, about how like movies now, like kids movies now, like they're they're not not that they're not scary enough, but they shy away from being too scary. Right. And that's why, like, that's one of the movies that's coming up for our Forgotten Horror, which is the house the, uh, with the clock in its walls. Like, mm-hmm. that was one of the movies that when I watched it, I was like, you know, it's it's scary. It's there's stuff in here that right. would scare kids, scare me when I was hit. But like, I'm glad it's in there. I'm not, I'm, you know, I mean, because you need that, and we talk about that all the time. Absolutely, yeah. The uh, the um the the way Watson in the books, how kind of Arthur Conan Doyle writes Watson in the books. He, he he's in awe of Sean Holmes, but it's never. I don't think it's in the books in terms of like how does he do all that. Like it's like a stupid awe, right? right? You know what I mean. He he he's intelligent in the book. He's an he's a doc. He's a doctor for crying out loud. In the book, he's an intelligent person. But Holmes is next level. And while they are awe inspiring to Watson in the book, he still kind of it's not like. It's not like it's baffling. You know what I mean? It's just like he, you know, the connections that hold that. Right. Right. He's intrigued. Yeah, exactly. That's why he's, he's writing these as novels. But but for some reason that got that gets translated sometimes as he's not as smart. And oh, he can, exactly. You figured it which out. is which is which I don't like. That's Lestrade's job. That's Lestrade's job. <laughs> right. Exactly. But even even in I do, though, like in the later versions of Holmes where Lestrade is not as idiotic as the even in this one he's not he's just he, Holmes is just a boy that he doesn't want he to ignores, deal with so he doesn't right? want to deal with his but course. then when he swipes his hand on the because what's happening is the the hood is uh, which is Mrs. Dribb is shoot who, who has fantastic aim is <laughs> shooting I mean like she is shooting blow darts basically that are that are tipped with this hallucinogen there are thorns yeah she is she does she does a blow dart across a street with horses and people running and and just in the and it's snowing and there's definitely a wind differential there and she first shot nails them nails them first wind shot to 50 knots you know targets 50 miles up <laughs> <laughs> what i don't like and this is not just young Sherlock Holmes this is any movie with blow darts or blow thorns or whatever the reason no one ever finds the dart they was like oh man i got hit by a bug a dart just went into your yeah. neck or a thorn is in your neck. Pull it out. Look at it. <laughs> Not right. <laughs> um, I also, there's, a, there's also always a stigma. There are, people always complain about the fact that when uh, people, because it always happens with blow darts. Mm. There was a fight with a blow dart and they try to take the blow dart gun. And they're going to sh- shoot it at you. And then the other person goes to the other and blows it into their, and it hits into the back of the right, neck. And always, what happens to Mrs. Drip. It has it happens to Mrs. Drip. It also happens in Indiana Jones, crystal skull, the fourth one, when uh, they're at their, Oh yeah. Yep. yep they're okay. at the grave site. And I was like, Oh, why would that stupid? Why would that happen? It's like, they're not, you, you act, people act like the darts, the thorns are, you know, made in a lab where the one end is round and the other end is no. These are like pieces of wood that yeah. they just dip. They're it's, sharp on both ends, right? They're sharp on both ends. That's how it works. I can't understand when people have the argument with me. It's like that's not accurate. Yeah, you not show me on the right, back end. I get it now. Blow darts that are made now that are finely coat waxed now. Okay, sure, fine. Not that they're made on the fly. There in, yeah. in back in the what is this? The not early nineteen hundreds, eighteen hundreds. Sherlock. As a child would be nineteen late mid eighteen hundreds. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Exactly. So that's. Uh, but yes, that to your point. Yes, that's something that I never really enjoyed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna talk about the ending a little bit. I will say, the way Elizabeth goes out, in terms of when she gets shot. Good shot. It's gut shot. <laughs> it's very. It's very Sofia Coppola style from The Godfather Three, <laughs> yeah. and it's it's almost like I'm only in this movie 
to make you become the person you become later on. Like I'm never meant to survive the Sherlock Holmes. Oh, for sure. As soon as and, she was in it, as once I got halfway in and I was like, okay, the stakes yeah. are kind of high for these kids. Right. I was like, she's not making it. Out. Exactly. And, and it's, it stinks because you see it a mile away and she's just like, no, and she, she's like, no, and she gets like, boop, uh, you know? So it's, like okay, and then and Watson's he, like, "Oh, don't die, don't die." Yeah, and and basically that's supposed to set Holmes down a path where I should never have any kind of emotion because it'll hurt. Yeah, and, and why he never marries. Yeah, and I get that. It's just it kind of does a disservice to the Elizabeth character because it kind of turns her into simply a device for the setting up of Holmes's character beyond this movie. A poorly written female character field. What exactly? <laughs> I, I've never I've never heard of such a thing. I can make her the. I don't want to rewrite the movie, but if you made her like the bad guy, quote unquote, uh, the baddie, if you will, or if, well, I'm just saying, or you made her somebody who wasn't as like she, she breaks his heart. I think breaking his heart like would that. be more interesting. I think making yeah. her the bad guy is too femme fatale. Well, but but, but here's the thing. You make your break, <laughs> break his heart. Then you're adding another character, you're adding more time. You're adding more. I, I'm just in terms of the plot that they have set up. That's all I was saying. Yeah. Well, you don't have to have him like. Go off and marry somebody else. Right. Or just have her have Sherlock do something so extreme to her that she's like mm, letting wraith die yeah letting, like not saving him like if like maybe like instead of like wraith just slipping but maybe holmes like pushes him and then that change yes yeah. that would be something no one will ever arrest you this has to be like yes this. And she sees that and goes there's a darkness in you holmes yes uh, that would, i just can't right. be but with. they're not gonna put that in this movie <laughs> no, but it would make it better <laughs> no absolutely absolutely but they're just not that's not happening in this film at all but which is fine because that's not the movie's not for 45 year old Mike. The movie's for 13 <laughs> year old. Well, at the point it came out, I was 10, but I guarantee you I didn't watch this in the theater. So we'll, we'll probably think in like 12 because uh, 12, 13, because that window between back then was longer. Than yeah, before now. the releases. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I do want one of those hoods though. Those look sweet. The giant hoods. Yes. They look heavy. They look like they'll keep you warm in that London I'm, winter. I, 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 yeah, I would definitely be rocking that hood. <laughs> So I want to point out that Wraith is actually an anagram yep. for Etar, which is the cultists that Professor Wraith is part of. Right. And we mentioned that a few days ago with our last seduction with uh, York, New York. Oh, the backward, the backward writing. Words. Yes. It's like, yeah, it's you're hiding in plain sight. Like you're coming up with the name. And that's the best you could do. You can't just be like Jones. <laughs> Come, like, no, let's do our let's do our spoiler. And just do it inside out or backwards. So Pro clever. Welcome to the school, Professor uh, Raythar. Wraith. No, Wraith. Jones. Bill. I don't Professor know. Professor Guy Bad. <laughs> <laughs> like, come on. That's so lame. Oh, oh wait. You spell Wraith differently. It's Etar. Oh, my God. Uh, come on. Ugh. Ugh. Sorry. I do like the twist at the end. I really like staying through the credit scene. Oh, and this right. is like the first time those it is. credits are really ever used. Almost. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, and first, you, you, you watch the credits and it's Holmes going home. Okay. Blah, blah, blah. Well, no, all you. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, and it's like, all right, I'll keep watching these credits. Maybe something will happen. And the credits go through and they end. And I think that's enough to keep you watching the credits for that end credit scene to pop up. And all of a sudden, someone goes and books themselves into a cabin, uh, a lodge, rather. Yeah. Like a hotel kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Outside of the city, and they ask him to sign the ledger. No, oh, please sign your name, sir. And you pan up, and it's Wraith. He's still alive. And when he signs his name, it's under a false name, and that false name is Moriarty. Nice. Sherlock Holmes, mortal enemy. Yeah, that's good. I like that a lot. Yeah. Although that means that when Holmes grows up, Wraith is going to be pretty old. <laughs> that's like when they have Joker be Batman's bad guy when Bat Bruce Wayne's like a kid. Yeah, that's it's true. It's like. So you're gonna fight like a 90 year old man. Yeah, that's, that's your tough. main villain. <laughs> that's tough. No, but that's good. I, well, I in terms of Moriarty, like he can be old because he's more just setting up. Yeah, homes. Although they have a karate fight at the end. Karate. <laughs> uh, this is also the first time that uh, Holmes was saved by Lestrade because we I talked about it briefly when he Lestrade swipes the basically oh. Holmes is like these thorns are poisonous or hallucinogens. You have to do something. You're an idiot. You're an idiot. You're an idiot. And he actually references the uh, oh, the the. the, 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 uh, the picture behind method him. yeah and uh, i can't remember i totally blank on it oh a great detective uh relies on perception intelligence and imagination and he's like who told you that it's like it's framed on your wall like that's something that that's something that um uh, holmes always says in his books 
and it's it was like uh, like embroidered on the wall behind yeah, Lestrade, those, yeah. so he throws it in his face. But anyways, he kicks him out, and then he, he Lestrade swipes the thorns out of the way, and one of them sticks him. So then you know you don't go back to it. But then later on, Holmes and Watson go to the house of one of the other guys that's in danger, and he gets hit while he's in danger, and he starts throttling Holmes and to the point where then Lestrade shows up and knocks him out. Right. And basically says, you know, I nearly had, I, I took three guys, six guys to stop me from hanging myself or something like that. Um, so he realized that Holmes was, was correct. And also he saves him, which is actually the first for that, for the, I guess the series. I think it's very interesting that all the guys that they, the cult wants to kill who were part of the old Egyptian curse. They get killed and everyone else is able to survive their hallucinations. <laughs> Yes, this is almost like very this this plot is very similar to the second season of Walter Carbon, because they like those 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 six guys or those five guys kill all those. Uh, remember when they go into yeah, the room? Yeah, they kill all the old. Then she's going for revenge. Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. true. I think I think that I think the reason why there's a lot of similarities is because this plot's not original. No. You know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah. The story's not original. It's it's not something that's groundbreaking, which is fine. But it's just not something that's groundbreaking. I think that's why we see a lot of similarities there. Mm-hmm. Uh, a couple kind of like bonus facts, I guess, if you will. Uh, since Spielberg was a when Spielberg produces, I don't know so much now, but back then he's very hands on. I mean, right. there's always that we was always that story about Poltergeist, whether he directed it or not. He right. did not direct Poltergeist. Um, didn't he? He though? did not direct Poltergeist. Well, yeah, next thing you're gonna tell me, he didn't direct Gremlins. He did not direct Gremlins. <laughs> but he's very hands on, and he's and he gives you notes and and. Spielberg giving you notes now if you're he's producing your movie if you don't listen to him I mean at least in some regard if you don't then you're stupid yeah but <laughs> I, that's a little harsh but so he had a Sherlockian uh, John Bennett Shaw read the script and then give notes and the Sherlockian is somebody who was obviously well versed more versed than we are on Shaw Holmes right. and everything and then he also had Jeffrey Archer the novelist come in and script doctor the movie to anglicize the script for the time period so basically make sure that the these names don't have enough vowels. <laughs> I know exactly. Mrs. Cremshaw. Who called this character Johnson? He's now Cragwitch. <laughs> <laughs> That's why Archer came on. <laughs> but Johnson is a British. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Rupert T. Johnson. No. Wax flatter. <laughs> <laughs> if you do not have a wax flatter in this movie, I walk. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also so the opening credit sequence as well is an homage because the opening credit sequence is the, the hood the shadow of the hood walking and then the hood you know blows a blow blow dart and you know that's right it starts as they're the walking first get the credits going right that's an homage to the basil rathbone nigel bruce home uh, holmes franchise that was very popular uh back in the 40s 30s 40s old, sounds yeah uh, 30 sounds right yeah i should have i probably should have looked that up <laughs> poor on me but anyway <laughs> that, that that opening credits is an homage to that so this movie's not made this movie's made in terms of in, in kind of in i don't want to say homage again but in honor and respect of the the estate of sherlock holmes the estate of yeah. carthagon but this, they do change things this movie is a well-done fan fiction oh yeah i know absolutely yeah. that's actually pretty good yeah absolutely i agree with that absolutely why do you think it's forgotten. Uh, in some ways, I don't know because this is so Spielbergian and so <laughs> I hate that term, man. I hate that. Term. You don't like that term? Here's the. Thing. I like Go, it. You know what? Own Continue your story, and then I'm going to okay. give you a Spielbergian story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that I'm surprised it wasn't shown. Like today, I can guess why it's not shown. A lot of stuff like that back that came from back then isn't shown too much nowadays. But back then, when I was a kid, it wasn't even shown. It, it kind of vanished after it came out and didn't do as as well as it should have. Do you think that it's not you don't see it now because it's it's not not that it's not good, but they don't really think people would like it. Like, do you think people in charge are like, I don't think people are gonna dig this? Yeah, I think it's it's kind of dated. It's very much inspired by Indiana Jones. It's like, well, why don't we just give people Indiana Jones? Yeah. And I think that that kind of hurts it now. Back then, I don't know why they tried to hide it. Maybe just because it didn't do well, and so it was like. Well, what's done is done. They've kind of put it in the back right, burner. Just right. No one released it on TV. It wasn't really repeated, at least when I was younger. I don't know if maybe in the it, late 80s I, it was more. I think I watched this on video, on yeah. video cassette. So it's like, it kind of just went the way of the dodo. And I think a lot of that had to deal with its initial theater release. I think back in the 80s, I think the early 90s, it's it's good. Yeah, If you were younger, you'd like it. Nowadays, though, I just think stuff like this, adventure, we've talked about a lot of times. Adventure is yeah. just 
not popular it's, right now. It's really, you know, what's not to cut you off, but it's really, I, there's not enough just adventure movies. It's always action adventure right. where action's first. There's not enough adventure movies. And I think we've talked about that before, maybe not on the podcast, but together. No, we've talked about on the podcast yeah, before. There's adventure's not. not in the I'm, right I'm sorry, but like you put this movie on Netflix, it's, people are going to watch it. I, 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 this movie, you may not, <laughs> here's my thing. <laughs> here's the thing. Movies now, I can, they're, they're not as good. This movie's still better than that. It's got every, kids would like this movie. It's preteens would like this movie. It's, you know, it, it's a movie that doesn't have a superhero. Oh, granted, Sherlock Holmes is an IP that everybody kind of knows, but it's not competing against the Sherlock Holmes that you see now, the, the adult Sherlock Holmes. Right. And I don't see, I, maybe we don't, maybe somebody holds it back. Like there could be like a thing where like, cause there's a trend now where, People like to crap on the movies that they made. Like, oh, I'm sorry about this. But like, they're like, they'll apologize for older films they made. With the exception of the fact that if they're, you know, obviously hurtful. Right. And I understand that. You you're, don't like certain moments. Like, you know, Bill and Ted, you know, they, they use a profanity, a, 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 a degradation of, of homosexuals. Right. And I get that. But they're also 16-year-old kids and they're, they don't know any better in that movie. Right. But regardless, I understand why that's an issue. But, like, I don't like it when people... Like well, Spielberg does it. Like, oh, I don't like this movie. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Tom I should have done that. It's like, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry, but like, you, you, they're out there. You made the movies, and you, you, you've had an effect on people in some way. You may be embarrassed about it, but you saying that you don't like them and not talking about them, mm-hmm. kind of, you're telling people that do like them. What's your problem? Why do you like these movies? Like, yeah. that's not fair. This you can't. Not good, man. Right? You're not allowed to like do that. Part. You're not. You, you can have a problem with your art, but don't vocalize it. That's not. That's not. That's not your job. And yeah. I, you can't determine how your art or your craftsman or your work of art or your work of any kind of fiction has any effect on any people. You did it. You own up to it. If you don't like, if you say like, listen, uh, I, I, I have a lot of fond memories of that experience. I'm glad that you liked it. Just say that. Don't crap all over it. Do Barry Levinson or Chris Columbus crap on his work? No, I'm just saying, <laughs> I, my point to that was maybe we don't understand, maybe behind the scenes, someone's like, no, don't put that out there. I don't like that. It's possible. That's also I mean? now, not only Indiana Jones, but the Harry Potter stuff. Yeah. That's hard to not look at but, and go. But, but oh, that's, that's even, that but that's, Potter? but you know what? That's though? more of a reason. More of a reason it. to put it out because you'll get people to want, you You want views. If that's it's on true, Netflix yeah. or something like that. Well, it's so, on um, Amazon Prime right now. But you got to rent it, right? No, subscription. Interesting. At least one, by the time at this point, like I'm wondering if like you put it on Netflix, is it going to be in their top ten? Like for one day, is it going to be up there? Yeah, lately, a whole lot of weird stuff has been seriously up on that top ten. Seriously, so maybe if you pop it up, yeah. you might get it. Well, we're in tracking. a day we're in a day and age where old content and library content are important right now. Dennis so. the Menace made the top ten for a couple weeks. Dennis so. the Menace made the top ten because they <laughs> they made, made the that 10. the top ten. Yeah, that was that was on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but back, I wanted to give you my Spielbergian story. Yes. So I'm not going to say who said this to me. Uh, and he doesn't even listen to the podcast so who cares so <laughs> we went to go see um i don't know if i said this already but we went to go see the minority report mm-hmm. and spielberg directed the minority report so yes, it was like six or seven of us we walk out of that movie and at the end of the movie in the minority report where it's a great movie i love that movie but it's very sci-fi futuristic the end of the movie ends with the precogs are in this cabin and they're all reading and they got all these books and they're alone it's kind of like a they're in some kind of place in ireland it's like a little it's a it's a happy ending for them right so they pan away and everything and uh one of the kids that we're with comes out and he's like oh that movie uh, i don't like that ending it's such a spielbergian ending and i turned to him i go it's a spielberg movie it's like it's his movie it, he can have that ending it's not a, you right. can't you can't be it can't be a negative it's his movie it's it, you can't negative be a negative on it. it that's stupid oh that was all too shakespearean well it was hamlet yeah exactly <laughs> so it's so you know he it's called a spielberg ending because he does those endings but like you can't hold that against him that's the well, ending he'll yeah. do yeah so I just you now throw that out there. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, would I you... also wasn't using it as an negative. No, 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 no. <laughs> I just when you say that, I always remind you. Yeah, that. I always remember that. Yeah. I remember that story. I always remember that. And again, like he doesn't listen to this podcast, so I'm sure he doesn't like me anyway. So who cares? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess would you would you recommend it to people? I would recommend it to like if you have a kid who likes Indiana Jones and stuff like that. Like adventures. Like adventure movies. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Show them this. Yeah. Like if I loved Indiana Jones, if I had watched this as a kid, mm-hmm. I would love this movie. But now I have issues because it's it's really not for me. No. You mean you have issues with the movie? Not you personally have issues. I have issues. Well, both maybe. Now I have issues. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I would recommend it to anybody like that. Anybody who likes Spielberg films. Anybody like even people my age who like it. I still appreciate that I watched it because like we said, 
you don't get adventure films anymore. Right, right, right. At least this is an adventure film and it's well made. Yeah. Even if a lot of this stuff has been done again and again. Yeah. So you heard my, you heard Butler. It's on Amazon Prime. Go watch it if you have that. Yeah. What's wrong with you? You haven't watched it yet? You should check it out. I, I don't I, I think that I'd like to think that this movie maybe slipped through the cracks. Maybe people if they listen to this and like, oh man, I remember that movie. I, I'd like to I mean, you know, check it out. I mean, I don't think it's it's not not worth your time. Let's put it that way. Right? right. Yeah. Yep. I mean, we kind of blew through a lot of it, but I mean There's is, a lot going on in this movie. There is. Honest. There is there, I mean and, and Yes, we may have some issues and we may not have some issues and we may like things and not like, but I think it's still, a, it's not long. It's only, no, it's short and it's, it's 109 minutes yeah, and it's fun. Yeah, exactly. It is PG-13. So, but that's more for, that's not for language. That's more for the violence. And the, the nightmares. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, this is one of those PG-13 movies for the scare. You know what I mean? Oh, like, yeah. yeah. When they give them that. Thematic elements. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So sweet. Yeah. Check it out. Um, uh, Mike, why don't you let everyone know where they can find us? Well, if you'd like, you can find us on forgotten cinema podcast.com or forgotten entertainment.com as we are part of the forgotten entertainment family. You can also find us all over social media. Just search for forgotten cinema pod or forgotten cinema podcast. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Those are our main ones. I know more are out there, but that's what we use Instagram more than anything uh, else. Yeah. We don't have a, we don't have, it's only the two of us. So we don't have like a bevy of interns. If we did, I'm sure we'd be everywhere. We'd be everywhere. Uh, but we respond to the comments you sent us talk about the movies let us know what movie you want us to do you know we do take suggestions we put them on the list it might take a while to get to them but we will get to them we love talking about movies every Thursday check out our fun commercials we do for our, our podcast and just I said at the beginning rate review subscribe help spread the word for Forgotten Cinema yay and yeah, join us next week where we'll be doing a movie called Rango Rango and I don't want to tease it but I'm going to tell you right now it's going to be a fight, <laughs> which is stupid because everybody likes Rango. Well, guess what, Butler? Everybody minus one. And that's me. Well, you're wrong. And I'm Mike Field. And let's go. And I'm Mike Butler. And we'll see you next week as I beat the crap out of Mike with his Rango review. You want to ring the bell? <laughs> <laughs> ding, ding. Oh, <laughs> man, that's awesome. All right. <laughs> this has been Forgotten Cinema. <laughs>